Okay, uh, seems like it's time to get started. And my name is Simon. I would like to tell you something about evil inspirations for Kotlin. And we will start with a sunny day in the park. Because this is what it looks like to be working with Kotlin. It's clean, it's concise, everything is awesome, and it has great compatibility with our existing Java applications. But you probably know that already. After all, for the past few years, every conference had at least one or two sessions about the topic. Even Venkat uh, included it in his keynote today. So instead of trying to compete with that, we will take a look at the darker sides, the rainy days. The people over at JetBrains managed to build some great safeguards to prevent us from having those days. But today we don't want to be protected, we want to be the ones who summon the rain clouds ourselves. So before we get started, this is me. I'm a simple guy who loves to code in Java, Kotlin and TypeScript. And as you might have noticed, I never had too much hair to begin with, so you can just pretend I'm already a wise and mature guy, despite my 24 years of life. Currently I'm working at Provincial Rheinland. And if you're thinking this sounds very German, you're absolutely correct, which is also the reason why I consider every laugh in this session as a personal success, so don't hold back. Um, going back to making life miserable with Kotlin and creating dark and cloudy days, I have developed the following formula for this presentation, which is damage is time multiplied by potential. Damage, meaning the damage done to our application or our co-workers' mentality, and time being the time necessary for another developer to actually find our malicious intent and fix it or refactor it. Potential, on the other hand, being the potential of the language feature we are using to cause unexpected or simply broken behavior. So let's start with time. Kotlin does a great deal of helping us there already, because Kotlin loves syntactic sugar. And what do you get when you add far too much sugar to your diet? You get diabetes. And just like that, we will also turn Kotlin's syntactic sugar into poison by adding far too much to our code base. For that, we will use some typical language features you probably already know, but I would still like to introduce them in a short manner. Starting with Infixing. It's a cute alternative way of calling your functions. Simply add the infix keyword to your function as shown above, and you can also call it without any parentheses, just like there. A very similar feature, but not entirely the same, is operator overloading with the main difference being that you can only define operator overloading for a fixed set of functions, of course, for the corresponding operators. In this example, for the plus operator. Both of those features are meant to keep our code clean, concise, and especially more human readable. But in conjunction with the next language features, you can create an absolutely convoluted mess of an application and the next language feature, of course, being extension functions. Those allow us to add any functionality we might have forgotten in our initial declaration retroactively just by using the dot notation and defining it in an entirely different scope from the original de declaration. Of course, there is a safeguard to protect us from overshadowing, so we can't override anything already existing. But it still allows us to do the following. In this example, somebody wanted his own class with arithmetic operations, a special int. But we won't question it for today. They had some reason. Instead, we will focus on the last line, the return statement. And at first glance, you might think, OK, there are three different functions called in this line. Plus, minus, and the infix conclude. 
but a little bit of decompiling reveals that in this single line of fu uh, functionality there are actually seven functions called. Two on the file level, two on the class level and the three aforementioned. This shows pretty much what I meant with time because it allows you to obfuscate your logic you're actually calling uh, and blow things up as much as you want. Because of course those extension functions can be spread throughout your entire application. Which means we have already evaluated half of our formula, leaving potential. And let's be honest, obfuscation might be annoying, but it doesn't actually break things. It, it's not enough to blow uh, up already existing functionalities. So we need some more language features to actually cause unexpected behavior in already existing classes and finished services, for example. And for that, I will introduce another set of language features, this time starting with type aliases, of course. Type aliases allow us to declare any, to add a declaration to any type we might have already defined. There is a um, safeguard called the redeclaration error, which prevents us from declaring anything inside our own compilation unit multiple times, but it still allows us to redeclare anything contained in another compilation unit. For this example, for example, sorry, uh, the Java library array with our own evil outsider class. And you might have already guessed where this is going. Of course, we can um, completely change the behavior of the uh, already wit written functionality with those type aliases by simply acting as a delegator. I will show that later. But the type alias by itself is still not enough to really cause broken behavior because it only works on the scope we have defined it in. So we have to use something to change the scope. For that, we will use package declarations. Those simply allow us to inject our type aliases into already finished packages and classes without even touching the files necessary um, for those to work. Just at the uh, package, um, you need to declare your scope, uh, your type alias in as a scope, and you're already finished. Pretty simple. This allows us to do the following. First one being the total account information service and a class called account used by it, which both contain private customer information in inside of fields not accessible to the public, which we will then inject our own type aliases to um, interchange the arrays inside of both classes with our own evil array. This will allow us to use our own evil array as a delegate to an inner array, so no functionality will break, nobody will notice any difference and the evil array will th then simply log out any interaction with the array functionality to our own evil server. So then we have the customer uh, information and can do whatever we want with that. If that is not enough of an example, I have still another one, which is actually my favorite. And it pretty much showcases what you can do with abstraction and inheritance um, in, with this type of functionality. In this example, we will use the native Kotlin, Kotlin in the extension function called thread, which simply creates a thread, but also accepts a parameter for class loader. And this class loader will then be used by the corresponding thread which is created. Here, this is an example function which simply initializes two threads when called 
And I also have written a simple test to call this function, but with a an URL class loader and a fixed set of URLs. So everything should work fine. The fixed URLs should be loaded inside of our threads until we add this type alias anywhere in our application and pretty much hijack the class loader of both threads which also, of course, works with any other ab abstraction. So we finally managed to deal some actual damage. We can cause completely unexpected behavior in any way imaginable. Which means we have enough tools to create our own evil clone army of classes and in inject them to our existing functionality. Don't get me wrong here, all of those features are still a part of what makes Kotlin awesome. Maybe package declarations aside, um, they are a bit questionable in my opinion. But it's possible nonetheless. So everything is okay, right? We have evaluated those language features, we have mentioned okay, Nothing will happen if we don't put some malicious intent into it, and if we don't try to break things, things shouldn't break. Well, that's not entirely true, because this is where human fallibility comes into play. All of those features are a perfectly normal part of the language. It shouldn't come as a surprise that people want to use them. So. As with everything in life, overusing them or using them without any caution will result in a backlash. So we have to take some precautions. And as with everything, there's no silver bullet, so I would just like to throw two rules into the room for that, uh, which we can discuss later. The first one being don't do invisible magic, and the second being only use the tools necessary for your task. I don't care which way we use to make our code transparent or to keep our stack slim. The most important thing about it is that we as developers remember that we have the responsibility to keep a lookout for those things. And that the language in itself helps us doing so, but doesn't do our job entirely. So, that being said, I hope this gave you some ideas. As I said, it's an inspirational talk. Maybe good ones, maybe bad ones. Maybe you want to tinker with your own projects. And if you've enjoyed the session, please give me a good rating. And if you have any questions or want to contact me or want to have further examples, you have this typical list of contact information including the GitHub repository for the slides. There's also another GitHub repository on my account with larger examples for the Kotlin user group in Düsseldorf, where you can find um, some bigger applications which wouldn't have fit into those 15 minutes. And in the end, a big thank you for being here and enjoy the rest of your conference.